Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Professor Daniel Holtz from the Department of Physics, Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics, Enrico Fermi Institute, and Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics. Professor Holtz researches Einstein's theory of gravity focusing on black holes and gravitational waves. He is here to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Daniel Holtz. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Daniel, can you give me a general overview of your career path from your undergraduate years to your current role as a professor at the University of Chicago? Yeah, sure. So I was an undergrad at Princeton University and uh, majored in physics and then went on to graduate school at the University of Chicago again, majoring in physics. And then I did a number of postdocs, so postdoctoral fellowships. I went to Germany for a year at the Albert Einstein Institute, which is just outside of Berlin. And then I went to Santa Barbara at the Kavli Institute for Theoretical Physics. I was there for three years. And then actually came back to Chicago just for a year to do a postdoc at what then was the Center for Cosmological Physics and eventually became the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics, and then went on to Los Alamos, where I was a Feynman Fellow, and then eventually became staff there. And then after seven years in Los Alamos, I came back to University of Chicago as a faculty member in physics, and now I'm in physics and astronomy and astrophysics and the Enrico Fermi Institute and the Kavli Institute for Cosmological Physics. So it's been kind of roundabout, but here I am. Wonderful. So Daniel, can you explain your current research interests? So I work on Einstein's theory of general relativity. That's our understanding of gravity. That is still the best theory we have to explain everything having to do with gravity, which is you know one of the two forces in the universe, the other one being quantum mechanics. And so the most interesting aspects of gravity have to do with cosmology with the universe on the largest scales and with black holes, which is kind of where the most extreme gravity manifests itself. And so I've been studying those topics. And in particular, black holes are these regions of space-time where the curvature, where the gravity is so strong that light can't escape. It's this very extreme physical object. I mean, there's no surface. It's just space and time but it has very strong effects on the rest of the universe. And so I've been trying to understand those. In particular, I've been studying gravitational waves, which are, if you like, vibrations in space and time. And that's something that Einstein predicted over a century ago, but we only first detected those vibrations, those ripples in space and time. Um, We detected those for the first time in 2015, and we detected those ripples from colliding black holes. And so that's my focus, is taking colliding black holes and then studying them by the gravitational wave echoes that they emit. And can you tell me a little bit about your work with the doomsday clock? Yeah, so one of the other things I I do is I'm a member of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, and I'm co-chair of something called the Science and Security Board of that organization. And that board sets what is called the doomsday clock, which represents uh, our assessment of the state of civilization and how close or far away we are from disaster, from kind of an apocalypse of our own hand. And so, you know, humanity now has, you know, the power to do tremendous good, but also we have tremendous weapons, nuclear weapons, we are causing climate change. And these things also have the potential to seriously damage civilization. And so this organization, which was founded by people like Oppenheimer and Einstein in the mid to late 40s, specifically as a result of the Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear power and nuclear weapons, those weapons are, it was recognized very early that those are highly threatening to civilization itself. 
And so the goal of this organization is to develop awareness and inform the public and policymakers to these kind of technical threats and try to suggest solutions and way to mitigate the threats. And so I'm very involved in that as well. It should be mentioned that that organization was founded by University of Chicago scientists on the University of Chicago campus, and the organization still resides on campus at the Harris School for Public Policy, even though it's separate from the university, it's its own organization, but the, you know, it's always had very close ties to the university. And Daniel, I imagine that when you were a child, you didn't necessarily say to yourself, hey, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be involved with the Doomsday Clock organization. I'm assuming that's not something that you were thinking about, but maybe it was. So that's a long way to ask you what you wanted to be when you were a kid. <laughs> yeah. No, I can't say that that was my, you know, life's goal, but I, I've always been broadly interested. And I grew up abroad. I grew up in the Philippines. And so perhaps I had a little more kind of global perspective. But no, I, I'm one of those guys. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do growing up. I just didn't think about it very much. Uh, I did like school and loved reading and loved science fiction. I definitely remember, you know, in the middle school years, spending most of my time reading. But uh, then sometime in high school, I, I was very fortunate to have a great math teacher and a great physics teacher. And both of them, those were the classes I just absolutely loved. And that kind of set me, set me on the road. And that continued through college and through graduate school. I've just been very fortunate to have a number of teachers and mentors along the way that were very inspirational. But I, I was also broadly interested for a while. I thought I would be a Shakespeare scholar or something like that. Or I love poetry, reading poetry, not writing it. And so maybe that would be an interesting direction. For a while, I was really excited about economics. So I guess always somewhat academic, but it never, it wasn't that I said, I want to be a professor. That didn't happen until graduate school, to be honest. And even then it wasn't all that well formed. It was just this vague sense that I'm really enjoying what I'm doing at the moment. And I'd like to continue to do it if I can. So when you were in high school, were you in the Philippines? Yeah. So I, I was in Manila. And what was that educational experience like for you? It sounds like it was pretty positive. Yeah, it was. It was a wonderful place to grow up. And the school was really great. This was the International School of Manila. And it was a very diverse, as you might expect, student body, people from all over the world, many different points of view. And now I realize in, in hindsight that the teachers were also quite unusual. I mean, it was a very international group of teachers and they all had very different backgrounds. And for example, my math teacher had a PhD in math. He was British and he had somehow ended up in the Philippines for some number of years and, but really had a deep understanding of math and was just truly passionate about the subject. And so it made for just a fantastic class. And similarly with quite a number of the other faculty. And of course, the students, you know, my fellow students, it's just such a fun group and such an interesting group. And I'm still very close with a number of people from high school, even though we've scattered all over the world, we remain in touch. So Daniel, were there any barriers or obstacles that you had to deal with along your path to becoming a professor? I think there are kind of... Many of the standard barriers that people run into, I mean, they, it's not as clear a path as some, and there's a lot of, you know, doubt along the way. Do you really have the ability to do this? Can you sustain the interest? Are you ever going to actually finish your PhD? There are periods where it just feels like graduate school goes on forever. I definitely had friends that were going off and doing other things and often much more lucrative things. You know, some became lawyers or went off and worked for places like Google. And, and, and for a while, there was some amount of doubt, like, have I chosen the right path? It definitely has many pluses, but it also has many minuses. You, you have a lot less control and a lot less certainty about the future for many, many years. And basically, you're a student for many years. And in some ways, I'm still a student. I go in every day and I'm, I'm learning and I'm not quite sure what the day is going to look like. And that aspect I love, but it can be 
you can question your priorities at some point in there when you're still in school and everyone else has kind of moved on with their lives. So did you ever work anywhere that wasn't a school? Did you do anything outside of academia? Yeah. So for a while, I was a postdoc and then staff at the Los Alamos National Laboratories, which is a government laboratory in New Mexico. And that is a very big lab. It does many different things. It's a, it's a weapons lab. So some of the things it does are classified weapons research, but it also has a theoretical division. And I was in the theoretical division. And in particular, I was in the astrophysics group there. And, and I was doing my research. I was thinking about black holes and gravitational waves and cosmology using supercomputers there to simulate the universe on the largest scales. It was really a phenomenal environment. A lot of very technically gifted people, very focused on, you know, solving just general problems. So it was, it was a great environment, but it was not academic. There are not as many students there. Um, there's no classes. So it really is kind of a, a research focused organization, which I loved at the time. But at some point you start to miss kind of some of the other aspects of academia. And so when the University of Chicago, when this opportunity came up at the University of Chicago, I decided maybe it was time to, to make the move. Yeah. What is it about academia that you enjoy? Why become a professor versus continue to be just a researcher or go into industry or any number of paths that you could take with your expertise? I've asked myself that, you know, many times, sort of what, what is it that I really want to do? You know, when I grow up, like, what am I going to do with myself? And, and I think there are many aspects of academia, which, which appeal to me. There's a lot of freedom. Interacting with students is extremely satisfying. And for me, you know, for the faculty, it's really the way you learn. One of my mentors, John Wheeler, would always say, you know, the reason that uh, universities have students is to teach the professors. And at the time, I thought it was kind of one of those silly sayings. And it's, but, you know, over time, I've realized it's, it's really true. The way I learn often nowadays is from questions that come up from the students. I work with graduate students and they're always pushing me. I say, oh, I think the answer is this. And then I turn out to be wrong and they explain why I'm wrong and teach me something new. And that is, you know, probably the most satisfying aspect of the job is that you're always learning. But there's another thing, you know, being in a university environment, there are all these amazing faculty, many of which have been on, on these podcasts and you get to interact with them and you can ask them questions. And so now, you know, if I have a question about a poem or, you know, something, an article in the newspaper, I can go find one of the world's experts, just, you know, just, you know, a five minute walk from my office and talk to them. We can go for coffee and they can explain. And it's, that is also just a great thing, just being part of this, you know, really intellectually vibrant environment. And that, that's probably one of the things I like most about being at the University of Chicago. So what is it about black holes and gravitational theory and maybe the universe at large that has sustained your interest for all these years? Yeah, I realized, you know, my very first research project was on black holes and gravitational waves. This was uh, as an undergraduate. And I then, you know, in graduate school kind of drifted off into cosmology and other topics and then eventually came back to black holes and gravitational waves as a focus. And that's what I've been doing over five years now, almost 10 years, um, as really my primary research. And, and the reason is because I think black holes are arguably the most interesting objects in the universe. And certainly from a physics perspective, they're these fundamental objects that in some ways really shouldn't exist, and yet they do exist. They're responsible for some of the most spectacular energetic phenomena in the universe. They come in all different sizes and do all different things. There are supermassive black holes, and you probably heard about the images of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and these supermassive black holes, as far as we can tell, are in all galaxies, at the center of all galaxies, and that's fascinating. And then there are much smaller black holes, the sorts that we detect the gravitational waves from with instruments like LIGO and Virgo, and that's 
I'm part of the LIGO collaboration and we listen to gravitational waves from those sorts of black holes. Those are also fascinating. They relate to the first generation of stars. But black holes also just in and of themselves, they're such extreme objects that they test physics. And so uh, what happens at the very heart of a black hole, what's called the singularity, is one of the greatest mysteries in physics. The black hole itself it has this kind of surface, this event horizon. No light can escape from that event horizon. That's kind of the characteristic aspect of the black hole. And that gives it a temperature. That's the discovery that Stephen Hawking made, that, that black holes actually have a glow because they have a temperature. That has to do with quantum mechanics and general relativity being combined. And so essentially all of our understanding of modern physics is, is wrapped up in this black hole. But then there are lots of mysteries hidden by this event horizon. What actually is happening at the center? What happens to information? Because the black holes glow, they get smaller and eventually disappear. What happens when they disappear? These are all fundamental questions about physics that we don't know the answers to yet. And so studying these objects is just, you know, this is the most fascinating thing you can study in the universe. And we now have these incredible probes, ways to study and try to understand them. And so that's why I've been so drawn to the topic. So what developments, research, or perhaps unanswered questions continue to inspire you? Yeah, so there are a number of things I've really been focusing on. One is just what is what do the black holes look like in our universe? How big are they? Are they spinning? You know, they come in pairs. We often see them colliding. How do they choose to pair up and how, how does it work? Basically, how does our universe make these black holes? So that's a big, deep question. It, we believe it has to do with how the universe makes stars, and in particular, the earliest generation of stars. We think that the very first stars in the universe were, because the universe was still very clean, it was just hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang. Those big, the first stars were very big and likely made big black holes. And we think we're measuring some of those black holes colliding today. So by measuring black holes, we learn about the earliest and biggest stars. So that's fascinating. But we can also use black holes to study the expansion history of the universe. That's something called using them as standard sirens, which is something I've really been focused on for my career. And, and by doing that, we can learn about dark matter and dark energy. We can probe the universe in a very new way. And so that's something that's just starting to happen in the last few years. And that's probably the thing I'm most excited about, seeing that to fruition and really having black holes be part of our cosmological tool set to learn about dark matter and dark energy. Well, aside from trying to figure out what happens beyond the event horizon, are there any specific goals that you have for yourself, for your career? You know, that's something I've been asking myself a lot because I've you know, done a lot of science. LIGO has been very successful. And I'm at a moment now where I'm just really having a good time. I, I, it's just, where, you know, there are lots of ideas. There's lots of things to do. There's so much data. Every day you turn around and there's something new to think about, new, something new to explain. This is a very unique moment in the field. And I feel like I've worked very hard to get to this point where I can do this. But it does feel like, you know, maybe it's you always want to keep challenging yourself and kind of going on to the next thing. And so since historically, I haven't put, you know, I never, I didn't say early in high school or college, I want to be a professor at the University of Chicago. I never had that specific goal. I can't say now that I have some specific goal for 10 years, but there is a sense that things are changing and, and some of the responsibilities I have are evolving. And in particular, I'm becoming much more engaged in some of these more existential questions having to do with the doomsday clock and trying to understand what the threats to civilization are and trying to figure out ways to kind of address them. And so that's been something I've become increasingly focused and hoping to really build on is, is an understanding of existential risk and how to mitigate existential risk. Daniel, what would you say is the most fun parts of being a professor? It's all quite fun. It's a really good job. You know, the part of it that I like the best is, you know, every morning you wake up and you get to 
just think about whatever you find most interesting. Like that's fundamentally the job is to learn something new about the universe. And so I often don't really know how the day is going to go because I'll have some conversation and we might get distracted and end up at the blackboard trying to figure out something, solve an equation, or type it away at the computer, running some computer code or reading some journal article that's, uh, you know, one of our colleagues just put out that's, you know, this great idea that we want to understand better. It's all very unpredictable, but that's, that's an aspect I really like. And another aspect I really like is that I get to work with all these amazing, interested, creative people, students and postdocs and my colleagues, both at the university and around the world. It's a very social endeavor. And it's this group of incredibly passionate, focused individuals that, again, are all just trying to figure things out. And to be part of that community is immensely rewarding and very stimulating. And so every day in that sense can be really, really satisfying. So what would you say then are your least favorite parts of the job or the parts of the job that you find the most challenging? Yeah, I mean, it just, I don't want to oversell it. There are definitely a lot of challenges. There are challenges along the way. The path isn't always easy. You lose a lot of control, for example, over where you live and what your life might look like you know, next year. There's a lot of uncertainty, job uncertainty, and it, it's you, you have to kind of be comfortable with just, uh, I'm just going to focus on you know, my research and just kind of hope that the rest works out. And if you're someone that absolutely needs to know where you're going to live and what you're going to be doing in five or 10 years, then graduate school is going to be hard. So that, that's, you know, unfortunate. And, you know, now that I'm a faculty member, one of the things that I hadn't realized when I was a student is that universities are sort of run by the faculty. There are lots of committees and there are lots of decisions and, you know, the admissions committees, the graduate admissions committees have to, you know, faculty are very involved and for hiring faculty are very involved and for any, anything having to do with what are the courses we'll teach? Faculty are very involved. And so you end up spending a lot of time on administrative things. And you also spend lots of time writing grants and getting funding so that you can pay for students and postdocs that you'll do research with. And so some fraction of the time is spent not doing science. And so you're in this position where you're surrounded by all these amazing people and there's all this great data and you've spent your whole life training and developing these skills and an understanding so that you can work on this. And then you'll spend a whole day working on a grant application or doing some university service or some community service, bigger community service, and not actually get to do any science. And th that can be very frustrating. But that's something I'm learning to manage as I think, you know, everyone does and control one's time and make sure that you get to spend your time doing research and doing the kind of fun science as well as doing all these things, which are, of course, part of the job and are important for the community. So, Daniel, what advice would you have for someone who is interested in pursuing astrophysics, following kind of in your lead, studying similar things that you're studying and you know, interested in a career in academia, what would you tell them? Yeah, that it's hard to kind of do a one size fits all. You know, to everyone is different and everyone is kind of motivated in different ways and has different kind of abilities and interests. And so the paths can be very different. I think the main thing is that you just, you need to really be engaged and love what you're doing. And if you don't love what you're doing all the way, I mean, it's not every moment is deliriously happy, but for the most part, you really just have to be very compelled and excited and interested in the research. And if that's the case, then the, everything else kind of drops by the wayside and, and you just go forward and it helps, you know, it certainly helps one be successful to be truly passionate about what you're doing. And if you're not enjoying it, then, you know, those are, you know, there are probably some warning signs along the way. What is the most fulfilling part about the work that you do? The most fulfilling part, it's, you know, some combination of, you know, figuring out 
how the universe works, which, uh, you know, the universe is so beautiful and it's so profound. There's just something about how this all ties together and the fact that, you know, we, we can sit here and figure out the earliest moments, like what happened in the earliest moments of the universe's existence and, you know, the properties of galaxies far away in space and time and that we can come up with a theory like general relativity that Einstein could do that and then that it predicts these crazy objects called black holes and that now we can show, you know, basically listen to black holes colliding at close to the speed of light and that it all kind of fits and agrees with predictions. It's phenomenal that that all kind of comes together. And so being part of that journey is, you know, immensely satisfying. I've been speaking with Professor Daniel Holtz. Professor, thank you for your time. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Thanks for listening.